How we doing guys? Today is Tuesday, January 30th. We're introducing our new Anglers Avenue Online Salmon School. Um, today is going to be class number one. We're going to have 10 classes, so two classes a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next five weeks. The idea behind this basically is to talk about different types of salmon and trout fishing uh, at different times of year, different ways to fish them, um, and to go into a quick 10 to 30 minute video uh, detailed information on how to do this and our hopes is it helps you guys do a couple things number one first and foremost catch more fish number two be a little more strategic on buying the right gear uh, equipment wise that the stuff you only need um, so you don't buy a bunch of extra stuff you don't need and then tackle wise guiding you towards trying to buy some of the right tackle we're not going to get a lot into specific colors on these videos mainly because I put out a buyer's guide every year in January to February time frame on what was hot for colors for last year for all the different species. And we also do fishing reports all year long with colors. So it's hard to really get into a lot of colors and predict things from year to year. Um, and we have those other sources we use to already do that. As far as our first class goes, it's gonna be on spring brown trout. Uh, the reason I picked that is because the spring brown trout fishing is already going on somewhere, some places on Lake Michigan, um, and it's going to start going on here in the next month and a half or so all around Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario. Uh, I mentioned that it's already going on in, in some places. The place is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, here on this side of the lake, we're blessed because we have maybe, or arguably, one of the most premier brown trout fisheries in the world in Milwaukee. And you can fish there in a boat almost year-round. Uh, guys for, can get out in January, February time frame um, and troll or cast for these brown trout. Um, trolling tactics are going to be a lot, a lot like what we're going to talk about right here or exactly like what we're going to talk about here and you can enjoy it right now if you live in that area and you have a boat that you can access to get out there. Otherwise, up and down the lake shore of Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario, um, brown trout fishing generally starts uh, early March when you can get your boat launched and usually ends around late April when the alewives flood the shoreline. Um, and I said it ends late April because uh, as soon as the alewives come in to spawn, which is a lot of times in late April, early May, they flood the shoreline to a point where we just can't compete with the natural bait anymore. No matter what we put out there, uh, the browns are gorged full of, of alewives and it's just hard with artificial lures to try and compete with that. So uh, we get about two months or so here in Wisconsin um, you know, up and down the shoreline except for Milwaukee to be able to fish brown trout. And that's, I think, the same way a lot on Lake Ontario. So it, it is a big part of the season. And if you're missing out on this early brown trout fishing, you're really missing out on a big part of Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario's uh, fishery. The best part about brown trout fishing, you don't need a lot of equipment. Uh, you can get by if you're a walleye fisherman with a 16 to 18 foot boat. Um, even, even some guys go out there on really nice days in 14 foot boats. And by utilizing a few things that we're going to show you, you can um, use your walleye rods um, or your salmon rods you already have um, for brown trout fishing. Uh, you don't need a ton of equipment. Um, you don't need downriggers. Uh, some guys use them, but you definitely don't need them. As far as locations go, there's three key locations that we, we fish brown trout in generally. Um, they're not in any certain sequen sequential order of importance. This is just the way I'm going to go through them. Uh, one of the areas is Harbor Mouse, probably the most common and most fished areas up and down the shorelines over the last 25 years for brown trout. Uh, Harbor Mouse, the reason that they're so productive is because you have the main river of that area pumping into the lake, that's usually where they put the harbors, is where the main river pumps out. Um, and when you have a, a nice river, usually a deep one, where big boats can get in and out of, you usually have some colored water. And a lot of times that water, because it is shallower than the lake water, is going to be warmer than the lake water. So when you get an area like the Sheboygan River and the Sheboygan Harbor, and that colored water pumps out into the lake, you'll get a concentrated area where the water will be a little bit warmer than the water around it. And the bait fish will collect in that area, and so will the brown trout. That would be why that's a specific area where we'd like to fish. Another area is any rivers that dump into the lake along the shoreline. So I'll give you an example again here in, in Sheboygan. Um, we have two rivers, the Black River, uh, which is south of Sheboygan, and the Pigeon River, which is north of Sheboygan. That one's quite a bit more popular. Uh, where they dump into the lake and 
they do the same thing basically as the harbor mouth. They both have a little bit of color, uh, not, as, not as much as the harbor area, but they both do have a little bit of color. But the main thing is both of them are shallow, so they're usually quite a bit warmer than the lake water. So when you get a nice wind or some flow that pushes that river water out into the lake, you'll get again an area, might be 50 yards, might be 100 yards, might be a mile, depending on the day. If there's a really big blowout, might be a mile stretch where the water is two, three, four, five degrees warmer in that area from the river water than it is on each side. That concentrates fish. Those are the areas we really look to fish um, and generally are the most productive areas to fish. On a side note, one more spot that you can check that isn't going to be my third spot here is anywhere where you have a discharge pumping in. A power plant, a nuclear plant, um, you know, any sort of warm water discharge that's pumping in the Lake Michigan, uh, that will be a key area for the obvious reason. Again, you're going to have quite a bit warmer water pumping into cold lake water that will concentrate the bait and the fish. And then the last spot is probably a spot that I've fished the most over the past five years, which is rocky shoreline. And when I mean rocks, I'm not talking rocks this big, I'm talking boulders the size of your boat or bigger. Um, and the reason we look for those really big boulders is uh, probably the brown trout's number one prey fish right now, or number one forage, is the goby. And the goby loves big boulders. They love to hide in those big boulders from their predators. Um, that's where they hang, that's where they love to be. And because the gobies are there, the browns are there. As far as depth of water goes, that really is a big range. Uh, we fish anywhere from as shallow as about four foot of water and out as deep as about 40 foot of water. Uh, we tend to fish the shallower side of that, but I'm gonna give you some reasons and, and um, some scenarios on why you might fish deeper. Uh, the key area the last few years, at least for Wisconsin side of Lake Michigan, brown trout fishing, and I think this goes sort of globally on Lake Ontario as well, the key kind of area, if I had to neck it down, would be like the 8 to 12 foot range. That seems to be like, you know, where the most concentration of fish are caught and fishermen are. A lot of guys don't like to go inside of 8 foot because it's, it's a little bit dangerous to go in that shallow water. If you don't know the area very well, there's big boulders there uh, in a lot of spots and you could hit the bottom or hit a big boulder with your boat and cause severe damage, so be very careful. Um, but if you're generally, if you're in that 8 to 12 foot range, it usually, not always, it usually doesn't go from eight foot to zero foot, you know, right away. You, you usually can see some some of that kind of stuff coming. So again, eight to 12 foot seems to be the, the key area. Um, I've done very well the last couple of years in as shallow as four or five though. Um, and you would say, well, why, why so shallow or why way out deep? Well, a couple things. Number one, you're almost always looking for the most warm water, the warmest water. And the reason you're looking for that is because when we're fishing these browns in March and April time frame. Generally, the water is going to be anywhere from 38 on up to the mid to upper 40s for temperature. And because the water is so cold, the bait fish are trying to find uh, the warmest water, and naturally so are the fish. Um, also, when you find fish in that little bit warmer water, they're generally more active than the fish are out in the cold water. Um, so then a guy would say, well, why wouldn't you always fish 4 to 10 foot of water, or whatever the case may be, 8 to 12 foot? Well, the main thing is water clarity. That's probably the most important thing about fishing spring browns. You're looking for the perfect colored water. And the perfect colored water, my dad taught me years ago, was if you have an outboard motor, you can just barely see your prop on your outboard turning. If you can barely see that prop turning, then you got about three foot of visibility or so, that's about perfect. If it's any cleaner than that, you're gonna have to use some stealth presentations to get the fish to bite, we'll talk about that. Um, if it's any dirtier than that, a lot of times you're in trouble because the fish just cannot see the bait and you're going to struggle to put numbers of fish in the boat because they're just not going to be able to find your lures. Um, so what we would do is we'll generally start in that, I like to start in that 4 to 10 foot range um, and if the water conditions are right in there, great. If they're not, because it's so shallow in there, if we had some major wind the day or two before that, that's the first area to get really dirty. We call it chalky. Looks like a gray colored water or a, uh, um, you know, more of a dark, dark greenish, real ugly looking color of water with very low visibility, uh, one foot of visibility or sometimes less. Then we're going to slide out to that deeper water until we get on that transition line. And again, we're looking for about three, four, five feet of visibility. Not any more than that, not really any less than that. So some days we may end up fishing in that four to 10 foot of water on average, that's probably the most. 
um, but other days we may be out as far as 20 or 25, sometimes even all the way out to 40 if we had a monster blow and the shoreline is just to tore to shreds. So while water temperature is very important, water clarity is more important. That's really the key to brown trout fishing in general. Let's talk about rod setups. So the main rod we're gonna use, if you have two guys or three guys out there, is gonna be planer boards. Probably gonna troll four of those, maybe even six of those setups um, all the time. Uh, and you can use inline planer boards, which is what we mostly use here um, on Lake Michigan. I know the Lake Ontario guys really prefer the big boards, which is fine too, whether they're Otter Boats or Amish Outfitter big boards with the big ski lines. Those totally work fine too, and when you get a fish on, you don't have to fight the board, that part's nice. Um, the downside to that is if you want to move your baits around in the water column, if you got three, four rods out of side, sometimes you got to pull rods and stuff to be able to do that. That's why I like running inline boards. You're much more versatile. Um, I'm going to show you the main setup that I use for the, for the planer boards. Um, this is our, our main planer board rod. It's, uh, you want a line counter reel. This particular one's a convector, um, whether it's an Okuma, Shimano, whatever, that's fine. Um, this rod's going to have 20 pound Power Pro main line. Um, that's a, a preferred line of myself. Um, lots of guys use 10 to 15 pound mono as well, and that's a totally, um, totally fine as well. If you like mono line, um, or if you have walleye rods already set up with it, um, that will work perfect. So either the 20 pound braid or 10 to 15 pound mono for your main line. Then on these planer board rods, you're gonna wanna run about an eight or 10 foot leader of fluorocarbon off of the braid, which you can see right here, going through the guides. Got uh, somewhere between eight and 15 pound test fluorocarbon. I prefer 12 to 15. Some guys really like eight or 10 because they think for running spoons, uh, like the Super Slim or the Michigan Stinger, um, you want real light line for the action of the bait. Anywhere between 8 to 15 pound test is fine. I prefer 12 to 15. We're going to run about an 8 or 10 foot leader through the guides here of fluorocarbon. And then we're going to get to the business end. In the business end, we're going to have, we're going to start by tying that fluorocarbon 8 or 10 foot to a snap swivel. And we're going to have a keel sinker, as I call it, or inline sinker. This particular one happens to be a 3 a ounce. Uh, that's kind of a hard one to get. I think we had some of these laying around, my dad and I did. Quarter ounce or half ounce are the most popular for this type of fishing. I suggest whatever ones you buy, just be consistent. Use all of the same size on your board rods. That way you can replicate what's working for you. Doesn't matter if it's quarter, three eighths, or half, that's fine. Just use all the same ones, that way you can replicate it. On the bottom side of this keel sinker, we're gonna have another liter of that same fluorocarbon whether it's 8, 10, 12, 15 pound test, whatever you prefer. I think we got 15 on here. Um, another section of six to eight feet of fluorocarbon to a snap swivel if you're gonna hook your spoon on there. This setup I'm showing you right now is for fishing spoons like those Super Slims or Stingers. Um, if you wanna fish a crankbait on this setup, you might have been asking yourself before, well, why did you tie a snap swivel to that to the end of that and hook the keel sinker on instead of just hooking or instead of just tying this top fluorocarbon to the keel sinker. Well this is why. We want the flexibility to be able to take this keel sinker off in one click of a snap swivel and hook on one of our Bay Rat crankbaits or the other crankbait we use a lot, the Flicker Shad crankbait. So if, if I go out there today and I put a couple crankbaits out and a couple spoons out and I find out that today's a crankbait bite, I can reel my rod in and literally in about 30 seconds, I can unclip this, wrap this keel sinker up, hook a crankbait on, and I'm fishing again. Don't have to do any retying. So just to go over this one more time real quick so that you guys make sure you got it, we're going to have either a 20-pound braid as our main line on our planer board rods with a line counter reel or somewhere between 10 and 15-pound mono line on our main line on the planer board rods. We're going to use 8 to 15-pound fluorocarbon all the way up to the to the snap swivel and then we're going to hook the keel sinker on somewhere between quarter and half ounce with another six to eight foot leader with eight to fifteen pound fluorocarbon to another snap swivel so that's our planer board setup rods generally if we're fishing spoons um, we're going to run these somewhere between 15 feet and 50 feet behind the board depending on what depth of water we're in 
Um, you heard me right, 15 feet. If we're going to fish in that four, five, six foot of water, you can't go much past 15 feet um, or you're going to be in the bottom right away. Um, if we're going to fish uh, crankbait, take the weight off, we get them way behind the boat, 100, 150 feet behind the boat. Um, the other setup we use a lot, um, I use every day when I go out brown trout fishing, is the mini slide diver. This is the double zero slide diver, um, as shown right here. Okay, we also call it the mini slide diver. And the reason why we use the mini slide diver is so that you can put out a nice long leader behind the diver and behind the boat and then engage this in and get it away from the boat a little ways. That way it's almost like a planer board, but still with the diver setup. And the main setup here is the same sort of main line. Whether you use mono or braid, that's fine. Same main line with a line counter reel. The slide diver goes right through the main line to your, to your barrel swivel here. And then again, the same fluorocarbon, whatever you used on your planer board, uh, eight to 15 pound test, about a six or eight foot leader to a snap swivel. I primarily run spoons on that setup. I don't run very many uh, crankbaits on that because the diver already dives down. So you really don't need a bait that dives down as well. You want something that's gonna be pretty stable behind it. Um, that, that's the rods. We run a six or eight rod spread generally when going brown trout fishing with either four to six planer boards and one of the mini slide divers on each rod. Preferred trolling speeds for brown trout is gonna be 1.7 to 2.2 miles per hour. Um, generally we like slower speeds because the water is really cold. Um, so I like 1.7 to 2.0, but as you get later into that April time frame and the water warms up even more, um, then we, we might bump the speed up a little bit uh, to that 2022 range, but generally 1.7 to 2.2 miles per hour. Uh, to wrap this up, we'll talk a little bit about the preferred baits we use. I mentioned a couple of them already. Um, as far as spoons go, we, we like to fish spoons a lot behind those weights on the boards. And uh, the two most popular spoons that we sell um, for brown trout, now there might be other spoons that work good, but the two most popular are going to be the Michigan Stinger uh, spoon in the Stinger size, and then the Super Slim spoon by Dreamweaver. Um, as far as colors go, the main thing with spoons is in the last few years we've really noticed that the gold back and the copper back spoons are really taking over. These two are, are gold back spoons. Probably can't see that real well, but they're not a silver spoon. These are gold back. Um, seems like either gold back or copper back spoons are really working. Um, some of the colors that have been working well, and again, this isn't a color thing. Um, we got other places to show you what colors work, but here are some that have been working. Gold perch, which is that one right there. Um, gold UV perch, copper yellow tuxedo, UV Jaeger bomb gold, UV inmate gold. Uh, this is a gold HUD special. Um, you know, etc. Colors like that really have been working. Um, as far as crankbaits goes, um, one of the crankbaits I said we use a lot is the Flicker Shad. Um, number seven, primarily Flicker Shad. Uh, I'm going to give you a little idea of what color selection, what how you make a color selection right here, because this is a perfect example. In my left hand here, or left spot, we got the Fire Tiger color. That's a real gaudy khaki color, real bright, shows up really well in dirtier water. So if you have a dirty water situation where you don't have very much visibility and you need some noise and some color for the fish to find your lure, the fire tiger would be the best option. Um, if you have a cleaner water situation where you have you know three, four, five, ten feet of visibility, the natural colors are better. Um, black and gold, blue and silver, chartreuse and silver, um, all those natural colors, purple, silver, whatever, um, tend to work better. We like to run these um, flicker shads anywhere between 15 and 50 feet behind the board as they dive a little bit deeper than the next bait we're going to talk about. So you might want to run these 15 or, or 30 or 40 feet behind the board. Just check, check the dive charts um, to make sure that you're not putting them out too far to get hung up in the rocks and break up break off your baits. Probably the most popular bait the last couple of years for brown trout fishing as far as crankbaits go has been Bay Rat's uh, two models of shallow diving crankbaits. Here in my right hand, I have the S3, which they designed basically specifically for brown trout fishing. They named it the S3 because it's a shallow three foot bait. No matter how far you put this bait behind the board, 100, 150, 200 feet back, it's only going to dive down to three feet. So if you're fishing in that four, six, eight foot of water range, this is the perfect bait. The S3 model of the Bay Rat because you can get it way away from the boat in clear water situations and it still will only dive down to three feet on you. The short shallow SS model, um, I use just as much 
um, is the S3, but I use this one when I'm out in that 8, 10, 15 foot of water. This one dives down to like 5, 6 foot, and you can still put it back that 100, 150, 200 foot back behind the board and get it down to, um, you know, that 5, 6 foot, which is about halfway down in the column if you're out in 10, 12 foot of water. Perfect spot for it to be for big browns. Um, as far as colors go, go there, again, some of the common colors are BT Candy, Fire Tiger, um, Yankee Troller, Cheap Sunglasses. This is that BT Candy here. Um, that's a great one. Um, you know, and there's lots of colors. Black Flash, Filthy Pouch, you know, black and golds, black and silvers um, that really work good. Uh, if you have any specific questions on colors, as I said, in the January, February time frame coming up right now, we're going to put out our buyer's guide. Um, otherwise, check out our website, which is www.anglersavenueproshop.com. We have a list of all the colors on there, and, and these baits are all available for sale for you to purchase. That's going to wrap up our first class of our 10-class session. Um, appreciate everybody's time for uh, tuning into these videos. As I said in our post, if you have any questions about brown trout fishing related to this video, feel free to ask it on the Facebook page where this video is attached, on our YouTube page where this video is attached, or you can email me at russell at anglersavenue.net, and I would be happy to answer any questions regarding this video for you. And if you need some gear, get on our website or give me a call. Have a great day.